Are you an individual? Sounds like a silly question, doesn't it? You're you, right? You aren't anybody else. But it's not quite that simple. First off, being good philosophers, we have to define our terms. What do we mean by an individual? There are many answers to that question. Let's begin at the beginning. That would be, of course, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. Ancient Greek philosophers, most notably Plato, said that there are particulars, individual objects, and universals. Plato wrote that particular objects are the types of objects they are because they share a universal form. So all those particular trees are trees because they partake of the universal treeness, capital T, treeness. And that means that each individual tree is less real than the universal tree. That's because any individual tree is only a poor copy of the individual tree. Sounds daft? Well, Plato's conception can explain why we recognize things as the type of things they are. He says we can recognize that there's a particular tree because we know the universal reality of treeness. We compare the particular things we experience with the forms of the universal to identify things. Plato said the way to understand anything is to consider its perfect essence. If I want to understand trees, Plato says, I contemplate what a perfect tree is like. That is, the universal essence of treeness that all particular trees must be like to be a tree. So we don't need to study all those particular trees. Just drop out, tune in, and turn on to the universal essence, baby. The same applies for identifying human beings in Plato's philosophy. I'm a particular human, and you're a particular human, because we partake of the universal form of humanness. But we are each less real than the universal human being. What's more, because being human is similarity to a universal form, the more unique a person is, the more distinctive a person is from other people, the further away from being human that person is. That doesn't mean anything as drastic as if you are taller than average or lose a limb, you are no longer a human being. But it does mean that being different is being less ideal of a human. So if you are weird enough, you may no longer be considered human, which is a big disincentive to want to be an individual. Plato took these ideas to their logical conclusion in thinking about how to structure a just and well-ordered society. Plato reasoned that because particular humans partake of the universal form of humanness, social policies should be derived from the objective interests of humans as a whole, not from the desires of individual persons. To understand what people need, he said, we need to contemplate what a perfect human being is like and what is best for that ideal of humanness. This is why Plato objected to democracy, the idea that individuals should be allowed equal voice in political decisions. It is not that individuals shouldn't be allowed to speak, but that individuals should understand that alone or even banded together into groups, they are short-sighted as to what is best for society because they are only individuals. Plato says that only by understanding the universal form of humanness will we see what are the best way to order the society. Plato's student Aristotle disagreed with Plato on some matters, but he also opposed democracy for similar reasons. Plato said that humans are a political animal, political meaning in his time of the city or of the polis. Any human without need or desire for the community was a beast, a subhuman. Thus, anyone wanting to be a lone individual or depart from how others are is a bit suspect. Unlike Plato, Aristotle didn't think universals like treeness and humanness existed in a higher realm, but Aristotle did think that particulars are what they are because they partake of the form of a universal. 
for the ancient Greeks then, am I an individual is the wrong question. Individuals don't matter, period. The polis or society is what matters. Only by looking at the social community as a whole will we see what are the best ways to order the society. This wasn't just a Greek idea. The Roman orator Cicero described the Roman Republic as a body and said individuals who were harmful to the body politic were a plague. Cicero's remedy for subversive individuals was banishment, remove the disease affecting the body. It would be easy to attribute this strictly to men in power trying to quash dissent, but more than that, suppressing individuality was based in a worldview that individuality was a kind of disorder or disease that needed to be cured or stopped, if not eradicated, from the body politic. Of course, dictators abused this idea, but it was an idea already woven into the social fabric available for dictators to exploit. If you thought you were an individual, you just might get burned at the stake for it. No, really. The word heresy is from the Greek hereresis and Latin heresis, which means to make a choice take a course of action, or to prefer something over other things. As the word heresy came to be used, to be a heretic was to prefer thoughts and actions that diverge from social norms. Romans persecuted Christians because the upstart faith diverged from how normal Romans were, how they were supposed to be. When the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, it maintained the practice of denouncing those who took actions different from the prescribed norm. It was never really about religion. It was about surgically removing the disease of individuality from the body politic. Could someone in ancient times be an individual? Well, not as we would understand it today. The ancients saw people more as parts of the social body, not as individual beings. And their understanding was driven by the assumption that a particular individual anything wasn't fully real. The universals were what were real. Turning to medieval philosophy, we can ask the question, as they did, can you think for yourself? Well, can you think for yourself? Maybe you can, but maybe you never do. And if you do, maybe you shouldn't. Believe it or not, people had those conversations in medieval and early modern Europe, which would be about the 10th to 18th centuries. Medieval Europe suffered from plagues, waves of barbarian invasions, and endless wars between rival nobilities. Life kind of sucked. Christian Europe partly owes its renaissance to the Islamic civilizations of Spain, North Africa, and Persia, who kept alive and expanded upon ancient Greek philosophy. Not surprisingly, Islamic philosophers and the Christian philosophers inspired by them kept with the ancient Greeks' belief that individuals were not fully real and not really desirable. If individuals aren't fully real, then an individual person can't come to truth on its own. At least that was the widely held theory. Plato said truth is universal, unchanging, and objective. Similarly, Aristotle said the truths are those rational principles that all men of practical wisdom can determine. Yes, only men. Aristotle was a sexist pig. In other words, there is no room for interpretation or perspective. There is one set of truths understandable by those with the correct wisdom, and disagreement is error, or worse. And there still was the ancient Greek view of particulars and universals. Thomas Aquinas' philosophy epitomized the Aristotelian view of every object having form and matter. Thomas compiled all of the Islamic philosophical commentary on Aristotle and put it into language Europeans could grasp. 
He wrote that the individuality of a person lay in its bodily matter. The individual has bodily autonomy, it, it can move on its own, but this freedom is unique only in its quantity. This person is this clump of matter, and that person is that clump of matter. Two instances of the universal human form. An individual person has a corporeal form, but it is an accidental, not a substantial form. That means your body is an accident in the original sense of the word accident as a non-essential property or quality of an entity. What is essential about you is your immaterial soul, for which medieval philosophers like Aquinas includes the rational mind. And these philosophers considered only the rational mind, not emotions, opinions, or individual perspectives. Inspired by the ancient Greek philosopher Plotinus, who was in turn inspired by Plato, medieval philosophers thought that there was a cosmic wisdom or mind. This cosmic mind is to thinking what the sun is to seeing. The light of wisdom illuminates truth and allows minds to perceive truth. For many medieval philosophers, the human mind was entirely passive, the only active mind being the cosmic mind. This means that we come to know truth only when it enters us. We do not come to it ourselves, much less create it, because we do not create our own light. We either take in the light of cosmic wisdom, or we are in darkness. This idea fits well with the concept of heresy I mentioned earlier. You should not try to think for yourself, because you can't. Not really. And you certainly shouldn't. Trying to think for yourself only leads to bad things, to err, to heresy. But not every medieval philosopher accepted that you can't or shouldn't think for yourself. A small dissenting thread of thinkers persisted in the notion that a small group of people do have the ability to come to truth by using their own individual minds. One champion of this notion was the Islamic philosopher Ibn Rushd, known in Christian Europe as Averis. Ibn Rushd saw humanity as divided into three types of people, which he named gold, silver, and bronze people. The lowest class, bronze people, lived only by reactions and emotions not reason. Their minds were entirely passive, and they needed to be told what to think and how to live. The large majority of people, he said, the masses, were bronze people. A smaller but higher class were the silver people, who were the religious and political leaders. These people tried to establish intellectual justification for their beliefs, and were useful in directing the masses, but they sought only to justify common beliefs and did not have fully active minds. The gold people were the only ones with active minds and the highest human intellects. These were the philosophers, and hey, what a coincidence, Ibn Rushd was a philosopher. These few extraordinary individuals could think for themselves and directly discover the truths about life, the universe, and everything, because they had active individual minds. Active minds. The concept of the active mind, allowing some individuals to think for themselves, was a minority viewpoint in the medieval period, but it was influential to later philosophy, as we shall see. Moving ahead into the 1600s, we go to early modern philosophers. Should you have a say in how your society is run. Easy for us to say yes. We live in a time when democracy, at least in name, is considered an ideal and a right. This has not always been the case. Prior to the late 1600s, the idea of individuals having input into their government and society was considered heretical. Strong men ruled, no women allowed, whether they call themselves a king, emperor, duke, prince, caliph, emir, or khan, political power 
transferred not by elections, but by the previous ruler's death, oftentimes hastened along by others. In addition to the authoritarian ruler, there was a small nobility and a larger population of serfs or peasants. The serfs belonged to the nobility, who also owned the land, and the nobility pledged loyalty to the autocratic ruler. We can see how easily the philosophical vision of humanity being divided into gold, silver, and bronze could be, and was, adapted to this social hierarchy called feudalism, suggesting that the serfs, the bronze people, could have a say in how things were run would have elicited laughter from the silver and gold people, the nobility and the kings. The peasants were revolting um, in the sense that they were considered unseemly, not that they were rebelling for the most part. No, the underclass mostly just accepted their miserable fate they really had no better option, knowing no one cared what they thought or felt. But back to the strong men, they were individuals. They had a right to want, say, and do things. They were considered to have their own minds, even when they were stupid, and these rulers were considered to have free will, a will that was the de facto law of the land. Louis XIV of France, who ruled from 1643 until 1715, a tremendously long time, epitomized the ideology of authoritarian rule of the strongman, a system glorified by some French philosophers of the time as absolutism. The idea was simple. There was one truth and one God, and therefore there should be one king who ruled over everything. Louis kind of liked that idea. Why wouldn't he? Political absolutism had its philosophical defenders and opponents. The three best-known ones were Thomas Hobbes, who was a defender of absolutism, and John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who were opponents of absolutism. Interestingly, all three argued for or against absolutism using the thought experiment that has come to be known as social contract theory. The idea of a social contract, however it was conceived, brought to the fore the role of the individual in politics and society. Thomas Hobbes had a contradictory view of human individuality. He wrote that people are individuals in that they all act independently based on what they want, However, they do not choose what they want because they have no free will. People have different wants and do different things, Hobbes says, only because forces act differently on the different clumps of matter that are individual people. Yes, this is a holdover from Thomas Aquinas' philosophy. So, Hobbes is saying, you think differently than other people, but not by choice. But for Hobbes, everyone thinking, wanting, and acting differently leads to conflict. It's the idea of heresy in a new guise. Everyone being individuals is what Hobbes calls the state of nature. And it stinks. Life in the state of nature, Hobbes says, is an anarchy. It's solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That is because, Hobbes believed, Humans are individuals who care only about themselves, who would lie, cheat, steal, and even murder to get what the forces around them make them want. The answer, Hobbes says, was for everyone to surrender all of their rights and freedoms to the sovereign, the strong man, the absolute ruler, who was the individual, capital I, individual who embodied all people, the body politic. The sovereign's will was the will of all, and the sovereign would act in the interests of all and keep everyone safe by imposing absolute rule. We all sacrifice our freedom for the security given to us by the power of the sovereign, who enforces all people to obey the law. John Locke's view of human nature was the opposite of Hobbes's. Locke saw people not as selfish brutes, but as altruistic and rational. 
In Locke's view, people care for others and can use their reason to understand what's best for everyone. Most of us have freedom of will and purpose. I say most of us. Because Locke had a mental block about including anyone other than wealthy white male Protestants in his definition of people. Still, if you were a wealthy white male Protestant, you were entitled to be part of Locke's social contract idea. In that contract, individuals use their benevolence and reason to balance their individual wants and needs with those of other individuals. This is actually a major innovation in the history of politics and philosophy. To assist us in balancing our various wants and needs, Locke says we create a government that works for the welfare and interests of the people. People, of course, meaning wealthy white male Protestants. Locke brought into light the idea that people had a voice in their government and should have a voice in their government because government serves the people, not the other way around. Locke's ideas on individual liberty and the proper role of government influenced the United States Constitution and social democracy throughout the world. Then there was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who opposed absolutism, but also opposed art, science, education, and civilization itself. Yes, really. Rousseau's credo was, man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. He meant by this that man, not women, they're irrational, foolish creatures, is naturally a free individual. But the power of social conventions enslave men. On the individual and government, Rousseau's vision was that everyone had their individual wants, But to avoid conflict, we must accept the necessary evil of society and government. To minimize that evil, Rousseau said that government needs to serve the general will of the people. That is, not the will of one or even a group of people, but the abstract will of all, which emerges from the conflict between individual wills. In Rousseau's vision of the social contract, Individuals discuss what they wanted, and competing desires will cancel out each other, and the general will emerges. Each individual then voluntarily subjugates his will to the general will, which is the sole sovereignty over all people. Rousseau said the individual develops and thrives within the general will. This means that though everyone is an individual, No one should go against the general will and must be brought into accordance with the general will for his own good. If this sounds like it wouldn't end well, you're correct. The French Revolution was patterned after Rousseau's social contract, and repression and punishments were meted out in the name of the general will. You are an individual with freedom and liberty. Now shut up and follow the general will. The question of what is an individual took a significant turn with the philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant's philosophical revolution is his realization that the mind contributes to human experience. Kant's schema explained how the mind contained categories of understanding that enabled sense data to be experienced as objects. The mind must impose a rational structure on the sense experiences, otherwise we'd have nothing but an endless jumble of unconnected impressions. So the mind is not purely passive, as earlier philosophers had assumed. The mind contributes to our experiences. You may think that, of course, our learning, past experiences, and feelings all structure how we perceive what happens to us. Today, we take that for granted, that our different circumstances and experiences make us each an individual. This was not the case in Kant's time. That today we understand that our individual experiences and thoughts help create who we uniquely are has to do with Kant's discussion of the active mind and what freedom is. We are each free individuals 
Kant says, because our practical reason enables us to know ourselves as a free person who is able to make and commit to ethical decisions. Ethical decisions relate to the question, what should I do? Kant said there are proper ethical decisions, such as, I should not lie. I know, as a free person, I can lie. But I know, as a rational person, I shouldn't lie. So I freely choose not to lie. Kant was definitely not the first to think that we had the freedom to choose, but he brought the issue into the center of a philosophical view of what it means to be human. By saying that the human mind is active and contributes to human perception and experience, Kant opened a door to a new way of thinking about human experience and knowledge. Kant's emphasis on the human being's freedom to make ethical decisions on his or her own was also extremely influential. Our mind imposes a form on sense impressions. This leads to the question, how active and free are our minds? Also, Kant assumes that there is one and only one way that a human mind structured experience, just like there is only one moral duty. What, the philosopher started to ask, if there are multiple ways that different individual minds are structured, what if our freedom to make ethical decisions extends to a freedom to decide how we think about and feel about our experiences? What if there are multiple ways that different individual minds are structured? What's more, if we have the ability to freely make ethical decisions, then can we consciously change the way we experience the world? Can I, as an individual, alter my own consciousness? Johann Gottlieb Fichte was the first philosopher to walk through the door Kant had opened here and said, yes, we can change the structures of our mind. Fichte's philosophy centered on the exploration of individual freedom. You are an individual subject, Fichte says. You have experiences. You make decisions. And you do things. The world gives you a vast field of opportunities. You create your freedom and who you are through the decisions you make and actions you take. You create your freedom, and you create who you are through the decisions you make and the actions you take. Those decisions and actions, in turn, structure how you experience the world. In effect, you are creating your own world, and the structure that you help determine is the ground of all of your experiences. Fichte says that real freedom is when a rational subject creates itself. This subjective activity is what makes you an individual. As Fichte said, he was taking Kant's notion of freedom and applying it not just to ethical decision-making, but to all human decision-making. Fichte's philosophy has come to be known as subjective idealism, in that in all of your perceptions, you only ever perceive your own state of consciousness. Fichte said everything is thought, and he defined thought as an action. That idea was picked up by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who said that everything is thought, and thought is the action of stringing together rational propositions. Hegel's philosophy that everything is thought is also considered a form of idealism. Hegel's idealism was an objective idealism because he believed that there was one universal consciousness, which he called spirit, with a capital S. Hegel said, we are individuals in that we are subjects who experience and think and act freely, but we're not individuals in that we are objects of history, the consciousness of spirit working out its creating of itself through everything that happens in the universe, including us. So, in almost a throwback to Plato, yeah, in Hegel, you're an individual, but you're not, which is that type of both and contradictions that fill Hegel's philosophy. Hegel's system of objective idealism 
became extremely popular from the 1810s to the 1910s. It is too complex to go into here, but his conception that we are the objects of history, and therefore not full individuals, drew the ire of two specific philosophers, Zorn Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche. They blow up the question of are we individuals, and demanded that subjectivity be the center of philosophy and life. These two philosophers were radically different in some ways, but they shared some core concepts. They more or less aligned with Fichte's idea that we create our own perceptual structures, and they both vehemently rejected what they saw as Hegel's opposition to individuality. Both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, each in their own way, urged people to embrace their subjective experiences. Both said that we don't have to just accept what we are told to believe. We are free to make our own ethical choices, and those choices make us who we are. Kierkegaard said that the awareness of our absolute freedom to feel and think for ourselves is scary. Not scary as in that animal could attack me, but scary as in, holy crap, I'm responsible for my own actions and I can mess up my life if I make bad choices. Nietzsche claimed to have no such fear, claiming instead that all historical belief systems are empty nonsense, there is no objective truth, so anything goes, go out and make the world yours. While Kierkegaard called for us to be introspective and discover the real meaning of who you are as an individual, Nietzsche called for a hell for leather attitude of overcoming our past and society and becoming an ubermensch, literally overman, who has overcome humanity to become something greater, an individual, not one of the gray sheep of the masses. Kierkegaard saw the need to find our individual ethical path within the objective ethical universe. Nietzsche saw the need for us to create our own individual ethics. Both of their philosophies have their own individual difficulties, but both celebrated the individual, the individual person, as the center of everything. Despite centuries of philosophical discussion about the question of individuality, we may actually be more confused than ever. And if you aren't confused, you aren't paying attention. Today, there is an ideological conflict between declarations of individuality in our self-indulgent society and declarations of determinism from cognitive science and analytic philosophy. Few of these colliding ideologies deal in depth with the central question, are you an individual? The turmoil over the question of the individual has some of its roots in the early 20th century. On the one hand, we had Martin Heidegger and Jean-Paul Sartre who said, yes, we're individuals, but that's scary. Heidegger said that we're each an individual, aware of our own individual existence, and concluded that being alive meant that we are constantly in dread of impending death. He lived until age 85, so he must have suffered a lot from this dread. Sarch said we had absolute freedom, and this was, to him, terrifying and nauseating. He even wrote a book about it called Nausea, a kind of autobiography of a sort. But what's really awful, Sarch says, is that existence is absurd and meaningless, and we're condemned to exist and to be free in a society of other equally absurd and meaningless people. Life sucks, and then you die. And, as he said in another play, no exit, hell is other people. On the other hand, the proponents of you are an individual, having not made a positive case for it, left us with the positivists, who said, we aren't individuals. Positivism was first proposed by August Comte in the early 19th century and adopted by the Vienna Circle in the early 20th century 
and maintained in what has come to be known as analytic philosophy. In positivism, what matters is the logical analysis of scientific observations. Non-scientific observations are inadmissible, as are any contemplations, speculations, and subjectivity. All of these threads of individuality are dismissed by positivists as metaphysics or worse, nonsense. An inheritor of these beliefs is the field of cognitive science, an arm of analytic philosophy that seeks a physics or biology of mental activity and assumes that mental functioning is entirely objective, not subjective, and leaves no room for human free will. Positivism also spawned the philosophy of language as a discipline which analyzed rules for the logical use of language. Purveyors of that discipline have at times attempted to lay out rules for how people should be allowed to speak. No poetry, please. No, we are analytic philosophers. They have had mixed results in their attempt to force their version of a logical language onto humanity. Philosophy of language has given us some important insights, some vital insights into how to talk about social behavior, but it also tends to reduce social issues to mere problems of language. It ignores not only individuality, but humanity and community. This is ironically also a mistake made by the descendants of Hegel's philosophy by way of Karl Marx. Marx took Hegel's notion of people being objects of history, but substituted economic determinism for Hegel's spirit. Hegel saw nation-states as the only true actors in history, the only individuals in history, and Marx saw only class struggle as the true actor of history. This, obviously, leaves little to no room for considering people as individuals. Some philosophers today see themselves as working within a Hegelian Marxist tradition, and though most would agree about the importance of social justice issues, there is among them considerable skepticism about the importance of individual experiences. They focus on political collectives and how these social bodies act, individuals being less important if it important at all. One of the few areas of philosophy that talks about and values people as individuals is feminist philosophy. In general, feminist philosophy can be seen as acknowledging the importance of both objective structural social inequalities and subjective individual experiences. Feminist philosophy places a value on what individuals feel and say and it acknowledges that our learning, our past experiences, and our feelings all contribute to how we, as an individual, perceive what happens to us. Injustices happen to individuals, and justice comes from listening to and valuing individuals. We find similar ideas and values in philosophies of race and sexuality, which also see the individual as struggling for recognition and justice within an unjust objective system. A larger debate is underway in philosophy today over how much weight we should place on the importance of individual experiences and individual suffering, and how it is best to be understood and remedied. All of this is taking place in academic philosophy amidst increasing self-centeredness and self-indulgence. People are much more free than ever before to talk about their personal experiences, feelings, and opinions. The idea that we should not judge others unless we understand where they're coming from is now part of our culture. Social media has given anyone and everyone platforms to express their individual perspectives and creativity. And you may have noticed, people often express themselves. But are these people? just emulating what they see other people doing. The goal in social media today, and all media now, seems to be create a meme that gets as many likes and repeats as possible by conforming to what other people are doing. 
The irony is that individualism has become a corporate marketing ploy. Corporations sell you prepackaged ways to express yourself. Be an individual by buying the same brand that everyone else is buying. Funny how these methods of individual expression all have corporate logos on them. So what do we mean by an individual? Is an individual person a distinct lump of matter? A mind with a distinct set of experiences? Or is an individual something more? The various debates over the centuries over individuality have so often circled around the question of whether it is good or not for individuals to think differently from others. We have seen that there are quite often serious resistances to anyone being different from the norm. But being different for its own sake doesn't seem to be a good thing. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche emphasize the value of expression genuinely coming from within the individual. That was true of individuality and freedom, they said. Genuine expression. But what is genuine self-expression? How could we know we ourselves are thinking and acting genuinely for ourselves? much less if someone else is being genuine. If we accept that we are an individual, what does that mean? What rights do we have? What obligations do we have? What does it mean to really be ourselves, think for ourselves, and genuinely express ourselves? Perhaps the answer is different for each individual.